Um, uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Um, as was stated, I'm, uh, I'm Marcus Zettenhofer. I'm from Bruno, but I'm not really from Bruno, as you can imagine. I, um, the Czech Republic is my fifth country, and uh, my career, in a way, is, is not unlike many modern scientific careers. And I thought maybe we would explore a little bit about career since there's a lot of students here. And also was asked to talk about the soft skills that would unlock, which is a big word, uh, but thank you, Marco, for suggesting that one, but unlock the potential. I'm not sure that I will unlock the potential, but I hope to give you some insight from my five years in the Czech Republic or five plus years in Czech Republic and a couple of other countries. And so uh, just by way of background, I'm I'm a geneticist, so I have a classic uh, genetics training. And my interest has sort of evolved uh, going into um, small companies. I was in some startup companies and then in large multinational uh, company. And as I said, I went to different countries. But what it's given me is a perspective from different places. Uh, and I've consolidated and self-reflected some of these issues. And I bring that forward to me every day in the work I do to help build our organization, Satec. Um, and I think this is something that I think would be important to consider. I think it would be important to consider for those of you who could go from a career that is, let's say, fundamentally steady to a career that could move yourself up in, into another level. So um, anyway, uh, that being said, I'll just, I'll just start about the outline here, what we're going to talk about today. Yes, this is a funny one. <laughs> No, it's this. It's going down. Ah, there we go. All right. Ah, so in fact, it's the opposite. All right. So here's the outline. Uh, career path. Talk a little bit about this. Communication. Collaboration, publications, grants. And then on the alliances part. Now, I know a lot of the other speakers are going to talk about writing skills grant writing and paper writing, and I'm purposely not going to touch on this. I'm going to touch on some, some of the other things, the sort of behind the scenes stories. And so um, one of the things that we realize when you look at your career, maybe today your career may look at like this here, which is uh, the one-on-one -on -one collaborations. But as you go further, you're going to start meeting a lot of other people. And it gets into these multi-stakeholder grants, a lot of different players from different cultures, which have different belief systems, different ways of communicating, different ways of operating, and different expectations overall. Uh, then if we build this a little bigger, it goes to alliances, large alliances, which can help shape not just your organization, but can shape country policy, could shape European policy. And so this is what I thought we would talk about today and how this correlates to, let's say, a scientific career in the modern age. But of course, underlying this is the skills what are the fundamental skills that we think you need? And a lot, of times, um, a lot of times when we look at our career path or think about our career path, we think of it like this. So when I was a graduate student, I thought it was going to be like this. You know, this wonderful little road that goes off into the distance and everybody's happy. And what it really turned out to be was something like this. So this is the Los Angeles freeway. And, and the point of this is that, indeed, there's many, many possibilities. There's, in fact, so many possibilities for a scientist that a lot of times making a good decision where to get off, which off ramp, is really a difficult one because you don't know exactly where it's going. Nobody tells you, right? So your professor tells you what? They tell you. Do the experiment. Be the professor like him. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they tell you to be the professor. I know there's probably some professors here. And uh, you know, I'm unlocking the secrets. <laughs> but in fact, I'll, I'll show a slide on this. Um, but, but in fact, that's one perception. Now, so the career is complicated. But one of the things you might ask yourself is, what is the career path for a lot of PhDs? And, and this, this list reflects uh, some of my friends and colleagues that I've had, what they've done. So the common ones, as we talked about, is this clicker is terrible. Okay. <laughs> the common ones we talked about is, okay, group leader, teacher, uh, professor. Anyone else? What is another job that you anticipate? Anyone? Nobody? You're going to do those three? That's it? 
Right, so multinational company, a scientist, maybe tech transfer, right? There's a lot of other skills that a scientist with a PhD and good skills could find a role for in society. Anyone else? Does anyone have another idea what you could be? Inventor. Inventor. Do I have it? Uh, okay, I have intellectual property lawyer. Okay, so in, in many countries, IP, intellectual property, and the lawyers themselves have PhDs in a background, as well as a law degree. And w where I've trained in the United States, they're very expensive. They're very, very expensive, which means there's, there's an upside financially and also intellectually for doing it. Management consulting. A lot of my colleagues went into management consulting because of their analytical skills. They can look at data, they can analyze it, and they can give good advice where to go. Startups, I think we had inventors, startups. So some of my colleagues are in this role. Um, then venture capitalists, some of those are giving money. Getting money from financiers and giving money to invest in startups and, and different sort of things. Then there were a few of my colleagues that, that did different things. Let's see, a yoga instructor, a spiritual healer. I respect that. They're in touch with, they're in touch with who they are. They feel at one. They're helping people. They see these skills as well. It's not necessarily you need a scientific training for this, but some of them do these things. Real estate developer. Uh, this, this fellow went into real estate development. He made a lot of money. Uh, and then um, my, uh, maybe my favorite one is I had a colleague when I was a postdoc, and he had a, he had a position offer as a professor at UCLA in LA. And, and they offered him, and then he said, mm, I don't think I want to do this. I don't want the academic career. So he's an Asian art dealer. And he opened up an Asian art studio, and he's, it's his passion. He loves it, and he enjoys it. So that's just a few of the different people that I see in the career paths of scientists. And, and the point here is really, you have to know what you want. Science is a great, great foundation. But you have to know what you want to do and what harmonizes with yourself. So as, as the, the, so one person alluded to, this is the career path for PhD graduates some five to 10 years out after graduation in Europe. So you'll see, you'll see a full 80% will go outside of academia. Only 20% stay in academia. And in fact, that's too many. Healthy number is supposed to be about 15% because it will break the budgets of most governments if you have too many academics, because the money comes from the public sector to pay, pay these people, the 20%. And then the very few, the 3%, make it to group leader or professor. So uh, this is something just to keep in mind. I mean, this is information, of course. So what is it the skills that the PhD has? I've touched on some of them. Analytical, critical thinking skills. You know, there's few professions that have this that have the ability to sort of hone in on data and make sense of it. This is really a fine-tuned skill. You're spending years, in fact, in the lab collecting data on this one skill and analyzing it. And no other profession that I'm aware of or no other training really goes that deep. It's really valuable to get this one right. OK, interpersonal leadership skills. This may not be taught so much in, in, in school, but you're leading projects, in essence. You're leading your own discovery process. You have to develop this. The extension of this is project management, time management, people management, hitting the goals, hitting the milestones. But this is not uncommon once you have graduate students. Some of you have students under you who do this. So you do this. Research information management, self-management, deadline driven. These are cool skills to have. Written and oral communication. This is what a lot of today is going to be about is mastering this. This is a key skill, not just for a scientist, but for you as a, a member of society, a human being. If we could communicate with one another, we would not have a society. Creative passion drive. I love this. If you're not doing this, you don't do this in your career and in your life, oh, find it somewhere. Find it, because those who are passionate and have drive for what they do, you can't stop them. They will succeed. Find that. All right. 
So I'm a big fan of, uh, of skills training. So for instance, for my, even my office, I put a little bit of money aside in our budget so that everybody has skills training. So everybody has a little budget, they do this. I believe that there's a continuous learning process. I myself, I continually try to challenge myself to learn new things. I try to push myself out of a comfort zone in order to frighten myself into believing that I can do something. It's important, if you want to be successful in science, you gotta take some risk. Otherwise, you won't do good science. You have to take risks. But you have to manage these risks. And training and new skills are important for this. So one of the things that I, before I start on this, I thought I would, I would give a confession. And, and I'll just let you in on a secret. And that's that when I was a boy, I, I, I didn't want to be a scientist. I didn't even know about science. I really didn't. I wanted to be a garbage man. Okay, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I wanted to be a garbage man when I was seven years old. And the reason that I wanted to do that is because I saw this man, this huge man. And I lived, I lived in California when I grew up. And there was a big driveway, so driveways where the car drives up. And the garbage man in those days would carry the garbage, a big metal garbage can on his back, and he would go up, and he would take the week's garbage from us, and he would put it in there. Then he would cross the property, and then he would go to the next property, put more in, and, and he covered about three houses of garbage for a week. And I thought as a boy, this fellow, number one, he's strong, right? Stronger than me as a seven-year-old. Um, but the other thing is he's doing some kind of a service. He's doing a service that we all need. And, and so, in fact, I, I grew out of that phase about being a garbage man. But the other thing was that the idea of a common need, a common service, a common purpose, really stuck with me as well. And so, in a way, this is what drives me to do what I do today, beyond science, uh, is try to find purpose in society through science to help develop individuals. And so, as I say, uh, the secret, I hope, is safe with, with this group about the garbage man, but it, I hope it makes the point. Um, so what do we got? OK, today, we're going to talk about collaborating. Why is collaborating important? And what are the different sort of elements or skills that's important in collaborating and communicating and going through this cycle of publishing and grants and alliances? OK, can we talk about this today? Hmm. All righty. If you have any questions, please let me know. All right. Please, there you go. We talked a lot about robots these days. Robots? We talked about skills. Yeah. So let's say in 20 years from now, yep. what are the critical skills that will lead to a PhD in which we will stay competitive? Keep learning. Because um, I, I, don't believe, I don't believe that robots will completely take over uh, many functions. They'll take over some automated functions. But there's still, there's still, let's say, a purpose for a human mind that can analyze things and think through. I mean, yes, there's going to be machine learning. But I, I don't know that, that some of the, the deep problem solving and even the, the communication and working together uh, will, will be solved necessarily by a robot. So I think if you keep learning, you keep pushing things, uh, you will always find a place. Unfortunately, if, if, if people don't develop and continue developing their skills, I. Yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. And we do see that with many industries that are going down. It's just a change in, 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 in industry and economic cycle. But so, all right. So here we go. Communicating. <laughs> if you read this here, I'm sorry, this, this thing is really tough. Uh, if you read this, um, all secondhand footwear is half off. How many of you understand this slide? How many of you understand second hand? What second hand is? Right. So maybe 20, 30%. This is a joke. And my point with this is that when we communicate, we, coming from, let's say, a native English speaker who understands second hand means used, but it's a play on words. I can't show this. I do show it today, but I'm showing it to make a point, is that culturally, linguistically, what I understand to be funny is not necessarily what you understand to be funny. What I say and do 
is not necessarily always conveyed to the other person to understand this. So the issue on communication at times is you may be talking and others are listening, but not processing. And so therefore the exchange cannot be healthy. Just like this. Most of you don't know what second hand is. So that's not useful. It's not a useful form without having cultural sensitivity. Okay? So what is it about communicating? Well, if we, com if we break communication down into three levels, it's, it's verbal. But one of the key points about verbal is listening. So there's a, an, a, a Native American proverb that says, the most important part of talking is actually listening. And the issue with listening is important because that's where the dialogue starts and ends. Writing. Most of the workshop will be about writing. So I won't touch too much about that. And then the nonverbal. So what, is, what are the elements here? So in the verbal clarity and conciseness, are you saying what you want to say in a way that somebody understands it? Are you using language that's measured for the audience or for the person you're speaking with? Are you approachable and friendly? How many times do you see people that are not so friendly? I see a lot of them. And do I want to talk to them? I have to. <laughs> but do I want to talk to them? No, no. But in order, to, in order to, let's say, have a communication, I mean, friendliness is important. Obviously, confidence is, a, is, is one key thing. Now, confidence is a tough one. And it's a tough one in this part of the world, I'll say, because I, th I know that many people don't, they, they don't trust what they know for sure. And, and you have to know what you know. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you have to know what you know in order to feel confident about it. And so a lot of times you don't get reinforcement saying, oh, yeah, that was a good job, and that builds confidence. But with perspective and engagement and knowing inside of yourself that you're an expert in this field or that field and you really understand it helps build confidence. But also you have to have the maturity to know that you don't really know something about this particular topic, and that's fine. That helps build confidence. It's very important for communicating empathy, right? I mean, are we, are we machines? <laughs> sort of, yeah, but, <laughs> but no, I don't believe that. We have to be open-minded to ideas. I think that's where new learning comes from, the open-mindedness and, of course, respect for others. People have fantastic life experience. They have varied life experience. People bring a lot of different things to the table. It's really interesting to learn from in an open-minded way, okay. Uh, right, writing, okay. I would say, so in writing, you should be clear where you wanna go. A lot of pre-thinking is important before you sort of go straight down the, the line of argumentation. Tone of writing is something I think the, the, they'll touch on today, how you express yourself, what language you use, what it conveys, whether it's in a polite tense or in an impersonal tense, whether it's commanding, whether it's, let's say, please, can you help me with this? Uh, that's important. Uh, simple language, obviously, less is more. Get to the point. Use an active voice. Uh, some of the writing is now changing from the, the classic scientific passive voice to, to an active voice, it seems. And I see some manuscripts using now mixed, mixed passive and active, so I'm not sure where, we, where we're gonna go with this. I know in, in, in social science field, it's different than in a natural science field. Um, so it's a transition, I can, I can see this, obviously grammar and punctuation. Nonverbal, right? Eye contact, right? Are you looking at, are you looking at your audience? <laughs> Eye contact, body language, facial expression, are you relaxed, right? Are you approachable? Are your hands open? You know, what is it? What's your posture like? What's your posture like? Is it like this, right? It makes an impression. When you ask, there, there was a study done which asked what do people remember most from a talk? Over 50% remember this stuff, this nonverbal, the body, and the visual of the slides, not the context or the content, but how this person looked, 
their word speed, their word choice. If they spoke too slow, they were perceived as non-intelligent. If they spoke fast, they thought that they were more intelligent. But there's also pauses for emphasis on different things. You see the voice goes up and down. There's many different things you can play with to capture people's attention. So tone and sound. All right. Well, I have to say this is really, I'm really not doing well with this, <laughs> but that's okay. All right, so the different types of communications that we have, so there's different levels, right? So when we, when we think about emails, letters, and manuscripts, you're basically restricted to the written form. Under the written form itself, you can use tone, there's word choice and grammar. It makes an impression, but it has a limit. In some cases, email, or let's say text message, is quick, it's to the point, but the next level of humanity, if you will, is the phone call. The phone call gets an urgency. So if I have a speaker, for instance, that doesn't answer my email, and I desperately need them, I call them, because they hate to say no on the phone, but they can ignore you on email. But then you need the verbal skills. Then you need to convince them in a verbal way why the argument for them to come and show up is really important. So it takes a different set of skills. It's different than, than the writing. The next one is face-to-face. -face. Obviously, face-to-face -face is, is a wonderful one because you can use your verbal skills, but you also have this, the nonverbal. You can really make an impression. You can, you can, well, or a bad one too at times, but you can make an impression. <laughs> could be good, could be bad. But the thing that you don't have with the face-to-face -face is the written. And so if you follow up with written, it's very effective because you're delivering on promise to say, you say you have an agreement face-to-face -face on a meeting, and then you write, you said, hey, that was a great, lovely meeting. You know, we agreed to do this and this. I'm really happy to be working with you. It reinforces that, that sort of meeting, that face-to-face. -face. So then you have all three. You got the verbal, nonverbal, and the writing with a particular individual to persuade them to collaborate with you, right? All right, oh. <laughs> all right. What can you tell me about this lady, either on the right or the left? Who do you like better, the right or the left? Well, okay, so how many, how many like the one on the right better? The right? Oh, sorry. Okay, how many like the right one on the right? <laughs> Nobody? You like the one on the left? Nobody? Okay, look, look. This is, this, is, this is the left and this is the right. How many like the one on the right better? Okay, okay, why? Anyone? What do you see? You're just looking at a picture, same woman. What do you see in her? Face change. Her gesture. Her, her hands are open, they're not closed, okay? The, the overall facial expression. This one is indeed making eye contact. And this one's face is tilted to some degree. This lady is more approachable. This is somebody you want to talk to over this one, right? So be mindful. I would say be mindful of how you position your body when you're trying to make an impression with someone. Because it does make an impression. This is about you and the other person connecting. I'll give you another example, if I can get this thing right. Okay. This, 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 this gentleman here, um, you, can see, you can see him uh, in two case scenarios. So one on the left and one on the right. So on the left you can see obviously President Obama, he, he doesn't seem pleased with what he's hearing. He's got the closed body stance, the facial expression, the eyes down. Oh, this is really an unhappy moment. But then of course, here where he's with the actor Leonardo DiCaprio, he's really happy. He's trying to explain something with open hands, chin up, and he's passionate about what he's explaining. That's what I read into this. Although Leo is, <laughs> I don't know. Huh? But you get my point. You get my point in this interaction. All right. Ugh. All right, okay, let me show you some data. Collaborating on paper. So I took this out. This is a, about a decade old study from uh, over four million publications in many, many fields. And I think what's important to look at here is the green and the red lines. And what it says, so the red lines are single author papers. And so you can see, is there, is there a laser pointer on this at all? 
Is there a laser? <laughs> this one? Okay. All right. So the green line, the, the red line is going down. Single authorship is going down with time. Okay, what's getting more popular is, is the green line going up, which is collaboration, publication between schools. So between schools means this school and another one. Within schools means within the same one. It doesn't change too much, even in the different fields. If you look at the yellow line, it seems to be steady. Arts and humanities is a bit of an outlier in this. But you can see both in social science and science and engineering, the trend is going towards, um, towards uh, more collaborative, more multi-author across the different universities. But you say, so what? So what? That's just how it is. Maybe the funding's like this. But um, if you look at the actual data, so this is taken from the same manuscript uh, from 2008. If you look at the impact of collaborating between schools, so that means this school and another school outside. Between schools, the impact increases both in science and engineering and in social sciences. And if you break it down to what type of school are you, are you collaborating with, or what type of faculties are you collaborating with, you can see tier one, so the top tier, so this is spread into four different tiers. Tier one to tier one, they have an added effect that's even bigger so if you're in a tier one school and you collaborate with another tier one school, you have more, more impact in this case. It's really citations what they're looking at. Tier two, tier two is also good, but not quite. Tier three and three. And if you're in the bottom, tier four and tier four, it's actually gonna hurt you if you collaborate. So I think here you have data that actually shows you that the impact would be greater. Now, it's not clear why the impact would be greater, but we could ponder to think why it would be. Now, for example, if you collaborate from this university with another university somewhere else, you have your network, they, could cite, they would cite you, and then you have that other network, and they would cite you. So you'd have more citations, you would think. That's one, that's one explanation for this. Another one could be that you have a certain set of skills, and you say, in-house, we have this skill, and we need to complement with something else. Not compete, but complement with another skill we don't have. So we will outsource it by collaborating and bring it together. The paper is then more comprehensive. You have different techniques that you don't normally have. You don't have to learn them. You just collaborate. And in fact, it seems as though the data tells you that you're going to, you're going to have a bigger impact. Question. You're talking about school-to-school -school collaboration. But what happens in reality <laughs> so this is a real life scenario, right? What happens? It's horrible for the institution. It's horrible for the institution. Uh, no, it's hor it, well, it's horrible because I think it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be good for the institution itself. If you have all the faculties and they don't find any common ground, why would you not collaborate with somebody that you think is good right next door? There's another set of data which shows that your likeliness to collaborate is also location dependent. In fact, you're more likely to collaborate with somebody that sits next to you in a desk <laughs> than somebody further out because it's more effort. I mean, that's what's possible. But you're more likely to also want to collaborate with faculty that are next door to you. But the issue is, is that existing history and uh, fighting for money and all of these things are barriers. Now, the issue is, what do you want to do as a scientist? Do you want to achieve impact? You have to overcome some of these things. And as an institution, an institution needs to support this, this sort of interdisciplinarity. We, in fact, have put in interdisciplinary grants. We put in small seed money to get individuals to work across disciplines, in particular biology and physicists, to get them to talk together. By, by virtue of having a, a little bit of money for a graduate student to have two supervisors to bridge that interdisciplinary gap. So I think institutions could do things to stimulate this, but they, they, have, to, they have to want to do it. They have to put money aside, of course, but I think it's, it's, it's one method you could use. Now, all right, collaborating, right? There's some common grounds here, of course. Um, you know, one of which is, uh, do you have a common purpose? I mean, do you want to collaborate with somebody where it's not clear what you're going to achieve together? It's not clear you get along? No, just for the sake of collaborating? No, it makes no sense. 
You want to collaborate with somebody that brings something to the table, and you bring something. We call this a win-win. Where is the win-win in working with somebody? You need committed personnel. It's not just about the concept, you know, unfortunately. It's not just about the intellectual pursuit and concept. It's about humans. It's about connecting. Do you like to work with these people? Is this somebody you want to spend time with? Do you want to, oh, do you want to have the arguments with this person? And they're good sometimes. But will you resolve the conflict? All right? And then you need, obviously, money. You know, we all need money. But how do you manage these cooperations? Trust. OK, that's a, that's a big word. It's thrown, out a, it's thrown around a lot. Trust is, there's a time equation to this. There's a familiarity to this. But how do you build trust with somebody you don't know? It's different for different people and different cultures. And across cultures, building trust is sometimes challenging unless you understand the cultural context and also the different personality types. Uh, but one of the reliable things is that if the person is always telling you what they mean, this is the integrity part. So what's inside of them, do they display this to you? And then can you do the same? Do you feel as though you can reveal this, not the biggest secrets of your life, like my garbage, garbage man example, but, but can, you, can you tell people certain things and they will work with this? And do they deliver? I think the reliability, you say, I'm going to bring that document on Friday you know, to you. And, and you do it. Or if you don't do it, you say, look, uh, uh, Honza, I've, uh, you know, Friday, I, I really had a, a problem. There was a delay. You write, you say, I'm going to bring it tomorrow. And then deliver. People understand that. But the silence, the lack of communication breaks trust. The unreliability breaks trust. And let's say friendliness or lack of friendliness is also something that helps build, well, the friendliness builds trust. And without it, it, it destroys it. So, so the bottom here, the bottom line is, is that money and rules is not enough. Money and rules is not enough for, for, for building meaningful collaborations. All right. So when we think about publications, there's a lot of different nuances to publications. There's some external factors that are involved. Ha. Ah. There's some external factors that are involved. Um, for instance, field and discipline. So currently, I'm writing a manuscript uh, as a geneticist with social scientists. And the biggest barrier that we had was that we like to see figures differently. So for instance, uh, in, in, let's say, natural science, we like to see a graph. You know, we see the numbers and the graph, and we like to display it visually. In social science, uh, they look at tables, and they look at, uh, let's say, statistical error, but never really graphically. And so that barrier in conceptualizing things is one barrier that we, we had to overcome. And in many cases, people don't overcome this because they just are not speaking the same language. And the language in this case is, how do you look at the data and interpret data? And so these are factors that could be worthwhile if you're going across disciplines, but you have to overcome it. The connection with industry, the understanding of the relationship before you get into the relationship with an industry is absolutely key. So you might say, well, you know, they don't want us to publish. Well, that's not true. There's certain rules to this, and there's certain rules that are more or less acceptable. You can delay on the publication, but you have to have an agreement with the company that you're working with that this is acceptable. And they have to honor that, because then they'll build the trust with you. But you also have to deliver what they want you to do. Otherwise, you know, there's no trust. As I say, when I was in a, comp I was in a company, I was at uh, Johnson & Johnson, and I contracted, uh, I, I, I did several contracts that were outside of our company. It was not uncommon, so half of my budget was contracting outside. But one of the things that we found was really difficult was contracting with academics, because they don't deliver. They don't deliver. You know, in a company, it's, you know, we got to deliver on time. I mean, it's money, it's pressing, and so forth. And so the academics we did work with were the ones that we could rely on, we could trust, and they would deliver certain things. And we gave them the freedom to publish. In fact, we often, often like to publish with them. So it's not a barrier. It's just about understanding the relationship. Now, different work styles. Some people are really rigid. They like timelines. They like delivery. Some are a little more creative, let's say. And, and so you have to understand that. So, but it's, it's understanding that relationship. Career stages. For a junior investigator, um, they may want to collaborate with a senior investigator, some senior professor, 
But a lot of times that's not the case. It seems that senior professors tend to collaborate with other senior professors and junior scientists collaborate with junior scientists. So, and the reason is their motivations are sometimes different. A tenured professor doesn't have to get tenure anymore. The junior is, is still trying to figure out where their career is going and so their objective may be very different. The junior scientists may be more rushed to deliver something, they need a paper, it's high impact, the senior person could sit on it forever. And so that has to be discussed too, beyond the hierarchy, if you want to go into these collaborations. Um, gender is another issue. Uh, the, uh, sometimes there's, a, there's an expectation uh, on authorship, order, and, and this, is, uh, this is a sensitive topic, I have to say, but there's, some, there's gender issues also. There's gender issues in relation to who takes authorship and, and how. I'm not saying, yeah, you're looking at me confused. I'm not saying that it's dependent on gender. The subtleties of deciding on these things is influenced by the balance of the people in the room during the deciding process, and gender does play a role. So we see that a lot of women get pushed out of first authorship roles uh, for some reason. But this is an issue that, that I think we should all be, we should be aware of. Uh, gender should not play a role in this, just be, be clear. Uh, but it, it seems that in practice it does. Um, collaborating. Uh, this is an issue at times about your institution. Can your institution provide uh, administrative support? You know, is this a place that I think I can rely on, even if I'm collaborating with them, that their administration will deliver this and this? Otherwise, it becomes a barrier to even work with the scientist, even though they're good. So these are all the sort of issues that we, we see in collaborating. Now, one of the things that we do know is that uh, on participation of grants, as we shift to grants, is that the participation is not the same in every country. So here you have the European countries. Uh, you can even see the highlighted versions of the, of the EU 15 versus EU 13. So you can see all the likely players here are just not participating in grants. This just happens to be uh, the Marie Curie calls. And so um, if you don't participate, you're not going to get the grant. You're not going to get the same amount of grants. And so there's a number of barriers to participation. I, I don't necessarily have time to go into this. But one of the things that we do recognize is, uh, is having a good grant office, a pre-award grant office, a grant office that will um, a grant office that will help you write your call will be important and actually seeks out the call and in fact contacts you and says, hey, you're working on this. There's this call and it's due here. I can help you. If a lot of places don't have that, they don't have that kind of pre-award grant office that will alert scientists to this. So that being said, what about grants? Why do we do them? Why do we, why do we get involved in these European grants? You know, I mean, they, they're very disruptive. They make us change the way we do things. They're big money sometimes. Sometimes they're not that big of money. But I think the thing that we get out of this is really through collaboration is research results that we think will increase impact. Because some of these collaborations that we have, many of these collaborations push us to move outside of our field, to move outside of our barriers, and publish in higher places. As I said before, the connectivity leads to higher impact. You can also extend your capacity scientifically. You may be good in one field, as I said before, and you know it. But if you can identify others that are good in these complementary fields, whew, that's, a, that's a win for you. You just have to get them on board. You have to identify them. You have to convince them to do it. And then you can, then you can work in this sort of framework. But of all the impacts, you know, there's some things that are required, and that's this coordination skill. Again, coordination skill, administrative support, communication travel, and language sometimes. Language. Do we know what all these words mean from different cultures when somebody's bringing? No. We have to have the perception of others saying, yes, I get it. I'm getting it. I understand what we're talking about and move forward. Some of, some of the tactics that you can use is repeat what they said. When somebody said something, repeat it back. Is this what you mean? And they say, no, no, not quite. The clarifying role is important also. Can help. Now, from from an administrative side, obviously, eligibility rules is an issue. Uh, in the early days, we got our, when we got our first ERC grant, um, which, which comes with 15% co-funding, uh, the host institution 
was reluctant to pay it. Um, and, and they were thinking about turning down our first ERC, uh, which uh, in retrospect, I mean, not in retrospect, at the time I knew it was absurd, but there's an issue of learning process also. Uh, but maybe it's also communication failure. Did we talk about the 15%? Well, if we talked about it, would they say, no, you can't go for it? But you have to have this dialogue. But there's also the expectations aren't always matching on financing, the rules, eligibility rules, support staff. I've already talked about the grant officers, pre-awards, um, and the communication skills. I hope I've hammered in project management. Obviously, this is, this is key. Um, there's various things to this budget, timelines, deliverables, and, 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 and people. I, I'm not going to belabor this, but on the people side, some of the skills that are important beyond the managing of personalities, because you have to realize that people are different. They have different motivations. Understanding their motivation is, is very important, but also the nuts and bolts of managing a meeting. So what's the agenda beforehand? What are we going to accomplish? What are the deliverables? Spelling this out, putting out, uh, let's say, minutes at the end to say, this is what we agreed, and here it is, and everybody agrees. So there's sort of a rigidity to, to the project management to some degree, but there's also a soft side. There's a personal side to the people. And in fact, the people part is the one that's at times the most difficult to manage, um, but it's something that's absolutely essential at getting any project done, is these people. All right, so, so one grant that we recently got is an interreg grant. And the reason I highlight this, this is a cross-border grant between Czech Republic and, and Austria. And we have, uh, at SATEC, we've uh, developed uh, open access infrastructures. We have a lot of core facilities, uh, about 12 of them at this point. They're open to anybody, any academic, uh, anybody from industry. Um, and we've worked really hard on, on trying to get this to, to a really professional level. And I'm really, really happy about this. And so now we've also included the Austrians, uh, in particular in Vienna, uh, with their core facilities. And we have this joint project to have access to each other's cores, uh, to have the personnel who are running the cores actually learn from each other. So we have exchanges uh, even on this level. But the, the point of this is that um, this may start as a cross-border collaboration. And we know that we're doing quite a good job at this. But we're also at a point where, now that we're so good at this, we're now submitting uh, a paper to the commission which argues how, which outlines how uh, let's say s small and mid-sized core facilities should operate. So from what we learn between these two countries from a grant, we're now pushing it to the supranational level. So this is one of the impacts that you can go as a scientist starting from publishing and collaborating to grants to thinking bigger about how it could make bigger impact even on, on policy. I'll give you one, one uh, well, before I do that. So, I show this slide a lot of times to, uh, uh, to students, um, to uh, PhD students in the first year when they get into SATEC. And uh, the, point, the point of this is really that life is about exploring. And the in internal exploration is actually key to understanding what your motivation is, what your strength is, what you can do, what you can accomplish. But it's also about vision. It's about where you imagine yourself going and perceiving this and conceptualizing this and knowing this. Because if you know, not concretely I'm going to be you know, this particular profession in this country doing this, whatnot. But if you know where you want to go, it's easier for you to accept collaborations or interactions with individuals and say, yes, this is in line with where I want to go. And it also gets you to say no faster. You say, actually, I'm not going there. And it would distract me from where, I, where my vision is going. So having this internal understanding helps you decide quickly. It helps you know, I got to go there. I have a gut feeling that this is a good person and it's aligning with my vision. Or, mm, no, this person, I'm not sure. I don't think we mesh, and that's fine. Not everybody gets along. Or this is not in line with my career where I want to go. So no, I'm done. I'm sorry. I, I, I really appreciate the offer, but uh, you know, I have too many things to do, and I'm going in this direction. But if you know somebody that wants to go in this direction with me, let me know. 
All right, so you spin the negative to positive. So, but then in this respect, there's also external exploration. What does the outside world demand? Right? Do we need more, oh, I would say, horse-drawn carriages in, this co in Europe? Well, maybe not. There's no demand for it. Is there demand for robotics? Yes, it looks like it. Is there demand for other things? Yes. And so part of this exploration that goes on is that you have to be attuned to yourself, understanding what you want, but the reality is also where are the demands out there? Where can you connect and be useful? Create an impact that others would recognize. And so I would ask this, so what are your strengths? What can you offer? And what's your vision for the future? And then where are the opportunities? How can they complement us? And then how to sustain the relationship? When you've got something good going and it's working for you, you want to sustain it. All right. So I'll give you another example. And this is on the alliance level. And so um, we at, at, at SATEC joined this. Well, we, founded, we were founding members of this group here with, uh, with these other institutions. These are research intensive institutions, 13 institutions in 13 countries. Uh, all of them are, are very good. Um, we're the only member from, let's say, EU 13 in this case. Many of them, Max Delbruck, Curie, Paris, CRG, Barcelona, VIB, Belgium, and so forth. We got together and we said, we want to push this concept of excellence. We want, we, because we were frustrated with the fact that some of the very big institutions, uh, some of the big institutions in Europe were controlling a lot of, uh, let's say, policy decisions and so forth. So by having 13 institutions together from 13 countries, this created an alliance that has weight. We have over 100 running ERC grants collectively. So when we knock on the door, they say, oh, OK, that's EU life. So, we, so now it's, it's allowed us to do certain things, including getting key people into uh, stakeholder roles in, in Brussels to talk about policy, to influence policy. Uh, but also, we've gotten some grants out of this. And so some of the grants have been under the societal, uh, the SWAFs, which is uh, society within for, uh, science within for society, um, one of which is, is uh, this grant here, Orion. So this grant is a, is a, a nice grant. It deals with open science, which is uh, Moidash, one of Moidash's uh, flagship initiatives, open science, open innovation, open to the world. There's nine partners, although the key partners in this case is, is both SATEC, uh, Max Delbruck in, in uh, Berlin, the Babraham in Cambridge, and CRG in Barcelona. Uh, it's a four-year grant. At the heart of this is really co-creating experiments that will engage multi-stakeholders. What this means is getting an understanding of what makes citizens interested in science, what motivates them, and how do we move them and our scientists to get closer together. One of the biggest threats that we see is the inability of the public to think that we're doing something that's worthwhile and legitimate. It's, in fact, very frustrating, because the public, at times, they don't understand what we do. And so for us, we're, we're essentially their employee. Let's face it. They, they pay taxes. They pay us. Um, but it's also our issue that we're not able to communicate effectively to, to the public, to reach them, to convince them of certain things, and hear their input. And so this exchange, this communication on a level that's beyond one-to-one, -one, but on the level of, let's say, societies and a sector of society, the scientists, is, is really critical for the future of science in, in many countries. If the, if the taxpayer and the, and the politicians in your country pay less and less and less, there won't be any science. And so in this sense, this is what this grant is about, understanding the motivation and seeing how we can address this with the public. So, uh, and, and what, what's good about this is this comes out of that big alliance. Because we said, this is something that's important to us. And we're going to go for this grant. And we're going to win this grant. And we're going to execute it. So even building up alliances at a larger scale could have large impact. All right. So I'll close with just 10, 10, I'll close with 10 rules on good collaboration and then uh, so one is um, don't be lured into just any collaboration. Collaborate with people that you want to collaborate with. All right, decide from the beginning who does what. Right? Who does what? From the very beginning, stick to your tasks. That's project management. Be open and honest. This is about the integrity part. 
Feel, feel respect, get respect. Okay, that's what we want. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Protect yourself from a collaboration that turns sour. Always acknowledge and cite your collaborators. Be kind to them. They're your colleagues. Seek advice from experienced scientists. Not everybody knows everything. I don't. I don't know enough. And if your collaboration satisfies you, keep it going. Right? If it works, keep it going. So I'll just end with this. I talked today a little bit about uh, scientific careers. I told you a little bit about my career, and I understand uh, a little bit more about your careers. But looking beyond just the student or the postdoc phase, there's many levels. There's a real expansive opportunity for scientists with your skill set to do anything you want, essentially. Even within the realm of science, there's much to do. And you can build this to a very big uh, operation that can make impact, even impact on society and in your country as well. But I think the underlying message is it does take skills. And recognizing the skills and working to perfect them and acquire them will help you, guide you along this way. Now what's important is to have some kind of idea where you would like to go. If you know where you would like to go, and then you get, let's say, advice from experienced individuals or from your friends, or intuitively you could find this out, acquire these skills. Keep learning so that you can get to resolve your vision, to get to the end uh, goal that you see. And so by building on skills and having a vision and communicating, I think you'll have a, a really fantastic career. Okay, thank you.